Hi, this is Dr. Frank. This is Chemistry 1A. We're going to talk about the very first half of Chapter 1 in this uh, video lecture. So, before we do that, let's talk about what materials we're going to need for this class. You're going to need either the second or the third edition of TRO. I emailed you that it's perfectly acceptable for you to find a used uh, copy of the second edition of TRO. It would work just fine and it cost a whole lot less. But uh, you will need one of them, either the second or the third edition. You're going to need an eye clicker. For this class you're going to need um, also mastering chemistry. If you purchase a used edition of TRO, you will need to also purchase Mastering Chemistry separately. It's being sold at the bookstore for $68, the same as the online price, but you will have access to the Student Solutions Manual, and if you get stuck on a problem, it'll show you how to do the problem. Uh, if you buy a new edition of TRO, Mastering is included, along with access to the Student Solutions Manual. Now, the all-important mastering ID for this course is right here, Chemistry 1A, Frank Fall 2013. No spaces, all caps. All right. You're going to need a lab manual. It's going to look different than this because this is the fall 2012. You're going to want the fall 2013. You're going to need a small window calculator that has LOG function on it and 10 to the x function on it. You will not be allowed to use a graphing calculator in the class during exams and it's very important for you to familiarize yourself with the same calculator that you're going to be using for exams so that you're able to use it effectively. You're going to need a Scantron form 20052. Actually you're going to need about I don't know 10 of them so if you buy a packet of it uh, you'll probably end up using them. When you store them, make sure they're flat and the edges don't get gnarly because then they don't go through the machine. Okay, you're, as far as the eye clicker goes, um, some of you might have an eye clicker, some of you are going to purchase an eye clicker. Either way, you're still going to need to register your eye clicker serial number. And the eye clicker serial number can be found either on the back of the eye clicker or kind of hidden away in the battery cavity. You will need to register it. That means you go to iClicker.com, you push the register button and tell iClicker your your name, your Fresno State ID, and your iClicker serial number. So that when I download that information I'll be able to associate the serial number of your iClicker, which is what gets recorded on my computer, to who you are. If you don't do this step, I just have the serial number and you don't get credit for the work you've been doing with the iClicker. It cannot be chemically broken down into simpler substances. You're probably all familiar with the periodic table, starting with hydrogen right over here, and then helium over here, and all the rest of them. Uh, actually, there's a little song that will help you memorize all the, all the elements in the periodic table. You want to hear it? Well, of course you do. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and astatine, and radium, and gold, protactinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. There's okay. Some elements are stable as individual atoms, like helium, or argon, or krypton. Other elements uh, are stable when only when they're combined with two or more atoms. So atoms bonded together this way form molecules. There's a molecule of hydrogen, H2. In order to be stable, you need two atoms of hydrogen bonded together. Now elements of course can combine with one another to form compounds. 
So a substance that is made up of atoms of two or more elements in a fixed definite proportion is called a compound. Water, for example, is a compound. Um, it's comprised of two hydrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom. Always, if it's water, it's two hydrogens and one oxygen. Okay? If it's not two hydrogens and one oxygen, it ain't water. And every pure substance has a unique composition. What's the matter? Let's talk about matter. We'll start with the three phases of matter. Solid, liquid, and gas. When heat is applied to a solid, its temperature and vapor pressure increase with increasing temperature because the molecules of the solid have increasing kinetic energy. At the melting temperature, heat is absorbed as the solid is converted to liquid at a constant temperature. When melting is complete, the temperature of the liquid and its vapor pressure increase. At the boiling point, temperature remains constant as heat is absorbed to convert the liquid to the gas phase. When all the molecules are in the gas phase, the temperature again increases as the gas phase molecules acquire additional kinetic energy. This is a molecular model of ice. Notice that the water molecules are locked in place held in a repeating pattern called a crystal lattice. The particles are not free to fly around. Such movement is expressed as translational energy. However, even in one position, atoms can vibrate between the bonds holding them in place. Because the particles of a solid are in fixed positions, solids have a fixed shape, and even if they are in a container, they may not conform to the shape of that container. Now, let's say I add heat to the solid, energy that is absorbed by the particles. At the melting point, the molecules have enough energy to break the attractions that hold them in place. The solid begins to melt into the liquid phase. Attractions between the molecules are only temporary, and the particles are not in fixed positions as they are in the solid. As attractions between the molecules are continuously made and broken, made and broken, this allows a liquid to flow. It conforms to the shape of the container, but fills the container only to the extent of the liquid's volume. In other words, a liquid forms a surface. We're going to illustrate the gaseous phase with molecules of formic acid. You can see them here bouncing around in this container. The particles are very far apart from one another. They collide with themselves and the sides of the container as they move randomly about. Because of all this empty space in a gas, gases are compressible. Unlike uh, water or a solid, if you do a belly flop in a swimming pool, it hurts because water doesn't compress. But if you jump in a, a jump house, uh, you can because the air particles filling the canvas bag are compressible. It can be squeezed closer together. So in the gas phase, no attractions between the particles. Uh, particles are moving with a lot of kinetic energy throughout space until they collide with either each other or if they're in a container with the walls of the container. So we know about the three phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. But for each of these states, we can classify matter in terms of a fixed or variable composition. Matter in which the composition is fixed is always made up of the same element or elements in the same mass ratio. Physical properties such as boiling point, melting point, density are also fixed. This is a description of a pure substance. Another type of matter has variable composition with variable properties. This type of matter is called a mixture. Now we're going to show you an example of a chemical change. Here we have formic acid, uh, a hydrogen connected to a carbon, carbons connected to an oxygen, two oxygens, 
and one of those oxygens is connected to a hydrogen. So the atoms are arranged in a specific way to form this molecule formic acid. Here we see them in a gas uh, bumping into each other randomly, bumping into the sides of the container, empty space between them. There are collisions between particles. If the kinetic energy is high enough, these collisions can lead to a chemical change where the atoms break apart and form two new compounds, water and carbon monoxide. So I'm going to hit the run button and the chemical change will start to occur. So watch what happens. Here it goes. Every one of those bursts of yellow light indicates a decomposition of the formic acid into water and carbon monoxide. The atoms have rearranged, different compounds have formed. After the reaction, there's no formic acid, there's just water and carbon monoxide. That's an example of a chemical change. So we've talked about matter in the three phases, solid, liquid, and gas. What kind of matter would it be, would we define it as, if the composition was fixed? In other words, it was always made up of the same element or elements in the same mass ratio. And the physical properties of this were also fixed. What would you call that? Well, that would be a pure substance. But suppose there's a different kind of matter in which the composition is variable and the physical properties are affected by that composition. What would you call that? That would be a mixture. For example, you could take a tablespoon of salt and put it in a glass of water stirred around and now you'd have a mixture of salt and water. Now that mixture would have a different boiling point and melting point and density than that of pure water. Or you could take two tablespoons or three tablespoons or four tablespoons of salt and each time with each one of those you would have a different mixture with different composition and different physical properties. For each one of those, they'd have their own unique boiling point and melting point and density. So the physical properties change because they're affected by the variable composition. Now let's talk about pure substances. For this kind of matter, a type of pure substance, it cannot be broken down into simpler substances by physical or chemical methods. So what would that be? We've already talked about it. And what would be the name of the smallest particle of this type of matter? Well, pure substances that can't be broken down into simpler substances by physical or chemical methods, those are elements. And the smallest particle of an element is the atom. But what would you call substances with a definite composition that require chemical processes to be broken down into simpler substances? Right? What would you call that? And what would be the smallest particle of that type of matter? Okay, those would be compounds. They have definite composition, and you must, uh, the only way to break them down is through chemical means, chemical processes to break them down into elements. And the smallest particle of the compound is the molecule. So let's talk about mixtures. Suppose you take a teaspoon of salt and put it in water and stir it around. When it dissolves, you have a, a mixture, a solution of salt, but you really can't distinguish that solution from a glass of pure water. There's no visible difference. When you look at the salt water mixture, all you can see is one phase and it's totally uniform throughout. So what kind of matter would that be? Well, that would be a homogeneous mixture. 
that would have one phase like that. And conversely, if the mixtures have more than one phase and variable properties in different parts of the sample, what would you call that? Uh, let's say you put in a cup of salt into water, you stir it around, and now you see you have a liquid part, but not all the salt uh, dissolves and some of it falls to the bottom. So you see more than one phase. You see the liquid and you see the salt at the bottom, the solid. What kind of mixture would that be? And of course that would be a heterogeneous mixture when there's more than one phase and variable properties in different parts of the sample. We're going to talk now about physical and chemical changes. Changes that alter only the state or appearance but not the composition, those are physical changes. When something boils, when a gas condenses, when you have something freeze from a liquid to a solid or a solid melts into a liquid, you are not changing the composition of the substance, you are changing its state or appearance or its phase. An example of that would be boiling water here. Here we have some water right here. You see? Uh, and we see the molecules of H2O. And if we apply heat and energy, those particles get enough energy to break out of the liquid and jump into the vapor phase. You cannot see a gas. You can't see water vapor. You can't see steam. It's invisible. The individual particles are too far apart. Well, that said, what's this wispy stuff here? Well, it's not steam and it's not water vapor. You can't see those. What it is, is a fog. It is particles of water in the gaseous phase. Some of them cool down begin to connect to other water molecules, form a tiny, tiny droplet. Tiny droplet grows to a point where it still is suspended in air, but we can actually see it. So that's a cloud, that's a fog, and that's what we see here. Major point, it's still water. It's still H2O. We haven't changed the composition of the water. We've changed its appearance. We've changed its physical state and its phase. Same thing over here with sugar molecules dissolved in water. Here we have sugar particles by themselves without water in the teaspoon. And we pour that into water. The water begins to surround each one of the molecules, pull it out of the crystal lattice, and dissolve it. The point is, it's still sugar. If you taste it, it's still sweet. You have not changed the composition of either the water or the sugar. So that is a physical change, not a chemical change. All right, well, what about a chemical change? We'll take a nail rusting. Here, the nail is pure iron, and it's in a metallic crystal like this. No oxygen in there, but wait, o iron can react with oxygen to form iron oxide or rust. Now we're changing the actual composition of the iron. It's no longer in the form of this rigid metallic crystal. Now we have iron connected to oxygen to form iron oxide. Different compound, different chemical and physical properties. All right, now speaking about properties, chemical and physical properties, we say that a physical property of a substance is a property that doesn't involve a change to the substance's composition. So what are some examples of a physical property? Well, things like density, melting point, boiling point, these are physical properties. Each substance has its own density, its own melting point, its own boiling point. And those are the physical properties that don't involve a chemical change. And of course, a chemical property is a propensity to undergo a change to the substance's composition. So what are examples of chemical properties? Flammability, corrosiveness, 
reactivity, all of these are examples of chemical properties. So here's a little activity we'll be doing in class. What we're going to do is examine these panels and we're going to want to identify elements and compounds in each one of these panels. We're going to want to talk about whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas in each one of these panels, whether it's a pure substance or a mixture, and can we describe what we have in each one of these panels. So we'll be doing that in class. A little about the scientific method. All science begins really with observation careful noting and recording of natural phenomena. But a scientist, by and large, is curious. And he sees an observation and he sees a phenomenon that he doesn't understand. And he wants to understand. So one part of the process, then, is to make a tentative explanation to explain what's behind the observation. We call that tentative explanation a hypothesis. And observations can also lead to laws, a generally observed natural phenomenon. For example, Sir Isaac Newton's law of gravity. That's a law based on generally observed natural phenomenon. But scientists don't come up with laws that quickly. They come up with hypotheses a lot. And of course, just making a hypothesis isn't enough you have to do an experiment and you have to test the hypothesis and either confirm the hypothesis or at least have it supported or change the hypothesis so that the results of the experiment are consistent with the hypothesis or dump the hypothesis entirely and come up with an alternate hypothesis. But it's a key part of the scientific method is to take your tentative explanations and test them to see if they work. After lots and lots of people confirm the hypothesis, the science community becomes more confident in it and the hypothesis becomes a theory, a general explanation of natural phenomenon. So that's the scientific method. You've been doing it all your life. Suppose you go to your computer and turn it on. It doesn't turn on. The screen doesn't light up. OK, so first you make a hypothesis. Um, is the computer plugged in? You check. That's a hypothesis. You do an experiment. You look. Yes, the computer's plugged in. So you discard that hypothesis. Is the screen plugged in? That's another hypothesis. You check, yes, the screen is plugged in. Next hypothesis, is the screen connected to the computer? And you look back and you see, pull on the cable, you see the cable's loose, you plug it in, and when you plug it in, all of a sudden, your computer lights up. So you've been doing this intuitively all your life. A scientist just does it in a very organized way and records his observations carefully and goes back and tests his hypothesis very carefully, writing down everything that happens. And then when he thinks he has a cool, really good hypothesis and it's been supported by experiment, he publishes. Well, here's somebody who did not do that. His name is J.J. Becker, and he's the guy who came up with the phlogiston theory, which lasted for about 150 years. It was a theory of combustion uh, back in the 1600s and 1700s. His idea to explain combustion was that some materials are what he called phlogiston-rich substances. And these substances, when ignited, release phlogiston to the air and form ashes. And the ashes don't have any phlogiston, so they won't burn. I mean, that was his idea of what was happening in combustion. The problem with it was that when you burn wood, of course, the ash that you're left with weighs less. So the burning wood loses mass. 
But when you burn metal and weigh the ash, the ash actually weighs more than the metal that you started with. And this is kind of confusing. If you have phlogiston being lost by the burning metal, how is it that the ash that's left, which has released its phlogiston, ends up weighing more than the original metal? So supporters of phlogiston said, well, okay, there's some kinds of phlogiston, like for metals, that weigh less than nothing. So when metals burn, they lose this kind of phlogiston, and what you have weighs more, the ash weighs more. They're doing everything they can to save the theory. So much of uh, chemistry in those early, early times were based on this phlogiston theory. I mean, you went to the university, you heard about phlogiston, uh, and it was, of course, completely wrong. Then Joseph Priestley discovered oxygen by heating the oxide of mercury and collecting the gas that was released. He saw how this gas supported combustion when glowing splints burst into flame when inserted into it. He put mice in a chamber of this gas and saw how frisky it made them. He said, only two mice and I have had the pleasure of breathing it. Priestley didn't know he had discovered oxygen. He thought he had found dephlogisticated air, a gas so hungry for phlogiston that it eagerly sucked it out of whatever was burning. On October 1st, 1774, Priestley visited. Three, two, one. On October 1st, 1774, Priestley visited Lavoisier in Paris and told him of his discovery. It was just the breakthrough that Lavoisier was waiting for. He had had serious doubts about the phlogiston theory and eventually realized that this gas Priestley had come across, he called it oxygen, was chemically combining with the materials that were combusting. He came to understand that in a chemical change, matter is neither created nor destroyed, merely rearranged, and stated this in his Law of Conservation of Mass. The mass of a closed system will not change regardless of the chemical processes occurring within. So now we know that when something burns like wood or methane, to make it simpler, what we have is reacting with oxygen and produces carbon dioxide and water. If this is not in a closed system, the carbon dioxide and water are gases and they leave the system, leaving behind the ash. If magnesium reacts with oxygen, you get magnesium oxide, which is not a gas, and which weighs more because now you're weighing both the magnesium and the oxygen. Okay, that is our video lecture for uh, this part of chapter one.